All right. Morning. 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 Everyone's awake, I see. I have barely, <laughs> I have consumed enough coffee that I too am awake. I do, I have two little announcements. One's not really an announcement, one is an announcement. Uh, the first one is not really an announcement, <clears throat> but as I was, maybe you've noticed, <clears throat> maybe you've noticed that pretty much every Sunday during that first little worship set, I disappear out the back with some haste. <sighs> Y'all, I don't know what it is, but since moving down here, that's the time frame every Sunday where all of a sudden my body's like, you need to use the restroom. <laughs> so if I'm running out, I don't want to, <laughs> please don't think. I had this, this lie in my head that it's like, oh, people think that I'm, I'm not engaged. Well, first of all, my worship should not be your focus, just like your worship should not be my focus. But I don't want you to think, I don't want you to be distracted from worshiping, like, why is pastor always going during the worship? No, I, it's, I'm trying to train my body, and it's not working thus far, okay? <laughs> No, I will not stop consuming coffee, um, if that's your recommendation. Um, that's the first thing that's not really an announcement, but I needed to tell you. Huh? No, I have got, thank you, I got to, thank you, appreciate that. But when I empty that one, I'll, don't finish it. Second one is a real announcement. Um, next week, we're finishing our series. Elder Mike is going to be bringing the message, finishing this series on Living Life Fully, which is good. I'm looking forward to it. Um, we haven't heard from Elder Mike in a while, so I'm excited. No pressure. I mean, God's going to do God things, but I'm stoked for that. And then the week after that, the Sunday after that, we're going to be doing something that's not new to Spirit Song, but it's new to Spirit Song while I'm being here. And we're calling it, we're going to call it Story Sunday, right? I think the testimony of, our, of God's people is very important, all right? And, and so we are going to have these kind of uh, scattered throughout the year. We're going to have these little story Sundays that are, that are separate from our series. And somebody's going to come up and share their testimony and share the word of God, um, not in lieu of a sermon, but as our message from the Lord that day. Because there is, uh, I, I believe, and this is some, some 90s uh, megachurch pastor probably coined this, and I took it from them, uh, but I believe it's really good, that your life, is the second greatest story ever told, right? What God has done and is doing in your life is the second greatest story ever told, the first that being Jesus, right? So uh, Deacon Michael is going to be sharing in two weeks, and now i got to let you know he dropped some breadcrumbs suggesting that he may be open to this because maybe God's doing something um, in his life, but I could tell when he dropped those breadcrumbs from me, he didn't really want me to pursue those breadcrumbs. <laughs> But I was a hungry individual, so I chased him down. And I said, so you want to do this? And he's like, oh, I think the Lord wants me to. So I am excited. In two weeks, in two weeks, let's make sure we bring, um, bring your, your friends, your family, your cats, your dogs. Your, don't bring that lizard thing that y'all got over there, okay? That's don't bring, million. yeah, you leave that at home. Um, but but let's, let's, bring in, uh, let's bring in a crowd to hear what God is doing. Uh, because I think that's going to be uh, just a wonderful, wonderful Sunday. Okay? That's in two weeks. Now that we got the bathroom and the two weeks from Sunday thing out of the way, what do you think? Let's, let's pray and let's get into it. Heavenly Father, we need your help, Lord. Lord you know I do. <laughs> we need your help. But at the same time, we bless your name. Lord, we pray this morning, I pray specifically this morning, that you hide this preacher behind your cross. Bless your people. By the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, for the sake of your kingdom in this created world. And all God's people said. Amen. Romans 12, 3, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. One of the things that my family does around the dinner table um, is we share what we call our glads and our sads. We go around and, and, we, and we say, all right, what's your glad for today? What happened today that made you glad? And we share. And then we go around again and we say, what's your sad for the day? And we share that. Now, we haven't done this a ton since moving here, um, probably because moving a family of six across country is, you know, mildly overwhelming. Um, <clears throat> But I was thinking this week about these, these glads and sads moments that we had over the last few years as our family. And I remembered one time in particular. Everyone else had gone. I'm last because apparently that's the spot for dad, right? <laughs> dad goes last. Um, I tried to tell myself it's because they saved the best for last, but really it's probably because they've forgotten about dad's glads and sads. I mean, it's, it, it doesn't hurt me or anything. <laughs> 
but they get to me and it's my turn to share a sad and I and uh, <clears throat> the kids say well we, we want to hear your sad dad but we also want you to ser- share a story about your childhood um, th- this happens from time to time they make a request uh, some some kind of you know happening they want to know their dad a little more and, and they ask this with such fervor they're very excited about when I was younger as if I didn't exist <laughs> I was never little <clears throat> But this time was different. This one particular time I'm thinking of was different. They, they didn't just want to hear a story about when I was younger. They said, Daddy, what's something bad you've done? What's the worst thing you've ever done? So wait, 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 wait what? You, no, I'm, I'm not going to tell you the worst thing I've ever done. <laughs> and they go, well, then tell us the second worst thing you've ever done. <laughs> and in that moment, in their childish uh, pursuit of wanting to know bad things that I've done, I also turned into a child. So when they said, tell me the second worst thing you've ever done, I said, no, I don't want to. <laughs> but they wore me down. And I ended up telling them like the 10th worst thing I've ever done. <clears throat> I'll share it with you here this morning. I was 14 years old. That's not the end of the story. You <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing I've ever done is being 14. I was 14 years old. My family was staying in a city called Battle Creek, Michigan. Uh, it, we were staying there over a long weekend for a basketball tournament. The families of the kids that I played with, uh, we did this on, uh, with some regularity over the summers. Um, <clears throat> we chased tournaments around West Michigan and, and well, actually all of Michigan, uh, because of course, uh, at that point, as a 14-year-old, um, we all believed, all my teammates and I believed, and probably our parents as well, we all believed that we were going to grow up and be professional basketball players because, you know, that happens to so many people. <laughs> I, in my mind, was set on being an athletic celebrity. <clears throat> so we chased these tournaments around Michigan. And when we played in these tournaments, um, we, 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 we kind of stay as a group, as, as families in a hotel. It was a very communal experience. Now, when we stayed uh, in, uh, in cities where the tournaments were on the beach, right along Lake Michigan, can I call that a beach in South Florida? I mean, yeah. Yeah. ish. <laughs> when we stayed on the big lake that had some sand next to it, is that better? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> yes, yes. <clears throat> when we stayed where there was water and sand, there was a lot for a 14-year-old group of kids to do. We'd go and hang out in the water. We'd play. It was, it was fine. But in Battle Creek, if you know anything about Battle Creek, uh, there's not a beach to distract us. In fact, there's not a whole lot going on in Battle Creek, except for that's where the Kellogg factory is. And I'll tell you what, uh, we didn't want to tour the Kellogg factory. I mean, cornflakes weren't exciting enough for us to, to pursue that, right? So when 14-year-old boys who think they're indestructible grow bored, uh, interesting things can happen. On this particular day, a few of us were sitting around undistracted. Remember, this is a time with no cell phones, no mobile apps, no portable gaming consoles. I was a 14-year-old during that small gap in history between the Stone Age and YouTube where we had really nothing. So we're sitting in the hotel room. Parents are taking a break from their children. And a buddy of mine picks up the keys to his father's rental car. His dad's truck was in the shop. And with unsupervised discernment, we concluded that without even saying a word, it was probably a great idea to test out this budget rental car, a 1996 Toyota Camry. That thing was just itching to go down to the gas station. And so were we. So we grabbed the keys. (laughs) We walked down with some haste. We get in the car. And since it was my buddy's dad who rented it, he got to drive. Plus, he was 14 and 8 months, so he had started driver's training, <clears throat> so he was the most qualified. <clears throat> Notice I said started driver's training. He didn't have his permit, he certainly didn't have a license, but he started, and that was something to us. And we took off. We exited the, the parking lot, we drove away from the hotel, everything was smooth, we were smiling ears to ear, ears to ears. We were smiling big, we were large smiles. Windows were down. Of course, back then, we didn't have these kind of windows. It was this, right? (laughs) Windows were down, probably blaring Alanis Morissette or Coolio. I don't remember which. We made it to the gas station. My overzealous friend, who was, quote, unquote, mature enough uh, to drive, 
uh, he, he really pulled out a wild card and he walked up to the counter and he tried to buy a pack of cigarettes. That was confusing to me. Um, I was 14, very innocent. Uh, thankfully, he failed. Uh, praise God. Not because I wouldn't have known what to do with them. Sadly, at that age, 14-year-old, the Marlboro Man was like our, you know, the, on the TV all the time. It's not that I wouldn't have known what to do with them. Um, and I didn't think that, uh, I wasn't legalistic enough to think that I was going to hell if I had a cigarette at this point. I just didn't want to smell like I'd been there. <laughs> so it was good that <clears throat> he failed. <clears throat> I mean, we were athletes after all, so we decided to get Gatorade. And as we walk back to the car and we get in with our Gatorades in hand, what a rush. We did it. We did it. We drove back to the hotel. That was a great 30 minutes. And as we walk to the side entrance of the hotel, feeling like we're on top of the world, my buddy's dad walks out that side door. Now we're face to face with a man who's responsible for the keys that my buddy is swinging on his finger, which I can't even do because my fingers don't fit in my keychain. He's swinging them, just like letting everyone know, look at me. We sip on our Gatorade that we just purchased. And he looks at our Gatorades and he looks at us and he sees the keys and this doesn't line up. Where did these boys get this Gatorade and why is he swinging those Toyota Camry keys? We froze. His dad gives us a look of confusion that turns into something else that I don't think I can say from behind a pulpit. <laughs> and before he can say a word, those of us who were passengers <laughs> all did this. <laughs> we took a step aside and we pointed at our buddy who had the keys. We wanted to... <laughs> We wanted to avoid being collateral damage in this situation. It wasn't us. We just rode along. What are you talking about? I mean, he made us get in the car. Can you believe your son? He should be ashamed of himself. What we did is we condemned and we withdrew. We condemned and we withdrew. Now, did the 14-year-old who took the keys and drive his father's car, did, did he deserve to be guilty? Absolutely, yes. He deserved condemnation. Um, but did he deserve it from us in that moment? No, I mean, we're all culpable. But come on, he was more guilty than the rest of us, right? So we condemned and withdrew. Condemned and withdrew. We all do this, don't we? We do this in response to, to placing blame, in response to things that we don't agree with, in response to, to people who we've deemed, quote unquote, unlike us for whatever reason. It's almost universal. It's so common, this condemnation and withdrawing within those of us who are humans. It's a part of our humanity, it seems. Almost as if it's a part of our nature. I mean, think about it. You ever had a, uh, no, not me, moment? even though you really could be or should be included. It's in those moments where we're actually thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought. <clears throat> We've all done this. We do it in situations where we're guilty in an attempt to avoid any negative ramification. We also do it in situations where we feel superior or entitled because of our gifts, talents, abilities, or status. We'll find ways to separate ourselves from others and the tool we typically use is condemnation and withdrawal. Remember, I said everyone does this, or at least everyone has done this in one way or another. Everyone well except one person. Sunday school answer? Jesus. Some of you were hesitant. <laughs> I even gave you a cheat. I said Sunday school answer. I mean, we should all know. Jesus. Jesus, when presented with the opportunity to condemn and withdraw in the presence of those who deserved condemnation, who expected Jesus to withdraw from them, he does something totally different. We started off this series a few weeks ago looking at Paul's words in view of God's mercy is where we started. And the last two weeks, we, we dove into what it really means to live fully in view of God's mercy. But today's passage begins with Paul saying, by the grace given to me, I say these things to you. By grace. Grace is undeserved favor. 
Sometimes I hear people say, I just don't feel good enough to receive grace. Well, duh, that's the definition. It's undeserved. (laughs) Paul reminds us not to think more highly of ourselves than we should. That we should look at ourselves, think of ourselves with sober judgment in accordance to what God has given us. Now Paul goes on and, 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 and he talks about how we have different gifts later in this passage. How we all work together according to God's plan, visible and active in the body of Christ. But before we get ahead of ourselves and and dive into those gifts, we probably should park here in verse 3 for a little bit, right? We probably should consider what it means to think of ourselves with sober judgment because those words are born of God's grace. Those words are born of God's grace for Paul, and they're shared with us as he is our brother in Christ. Those very words that we look at today They might be pointing to something that would help us live life fully. But instead of diving into another word study this week, last two weeks we really dove into a few different key words and we we unpacked them with uh, original context and and some, some ancient linguistics to understand what was best being communicated. I thought this week instead of doing a word study, maybe let's look at a couple narratives to better understand what's being said here. Is that okay with you? I hope so, because that's what we have prepared. In Luke 19, we find a, uh, find a man named Zacchaeus. Maybe you're familiar. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, um, which means this man uh, is someone who has betrayed his people, right? I mean, he was a Jewish man who became a tax collector for Rome. Uh, he was a sellout. Uh, he was working for the oppressive Roman government. But if that wasn't bad enough, uh, he was uh, specifically a tax collector, someone who would skim off the top, who would, who would charge his brothers and sisters in, in, uh, in his Jewish communities more than they owed, and he'd keep it for himself. And Rome didn't care that he did this because that's what tax collectors do. I mean, uh, they were still getting theirs, and uh, Zacchaeus was just using the system to profit and benefit for himself. And this was a betrayal of his people. Because the tax rate, you need to understand, it wasn't like here in Florida. The tax rate during that time in that area was roughly 80% of one's income. See, the tax system was in place to intentionally hold Israel down to keep Rome in control. And if 80% wasn't enough, Zacchaeus was taking more. Israel never able to fight back because they couldn't afford to, and Rome kept getting wealthier. And Zacchaeus became a hand of Rome so he could benefit from this reality. Well, one day amidst uh, his cheating, his very people, uh, he hears of this man Jesus coming to town. And everyone's excited about it. People are, are all a rage about this Jesus character. They don't know exactly what he is, but they know that there's miracles attached to him, and they know that he's a prophet, he's a great teacher. This, this is someone you want to see. People are excited, and they start lining the streets just to catch a glimpse of this Jesus as he enters town. But uh, do you think anyone's saving Zacchaeus a seat? No. Who's going to make room for this tax-collecting traitor? Nobody. And he's short. Now, <clears throat> I, I, I have to note, sure, he could have been physically short. I mean, we've been talk, we, I mean, we sing those songs. If you grew up in the church, maybe you sang the, uh, a wee little man was he, right? <laughs> Just a wee little man. He wasn't Scottish, but for some reason, that's the way we sing it. <laughs> a wee little man, and he started Lucky Charms. That's terrible. Probably racist. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Okay. Um, it says that he was short, and sure, it very well could be that he was physically short. Um, and you go, oh, that makes sense in Scripture. That's why he had to climb a tree, if you know the story. Yeah, but I need you to understand, too, that short in that culture, being short in that culture also meant that you are not well-liked at all, that you are not respected, and you do not have good standing with your peers. Either way, whether he's physically short or otherwise, we know <clears throat> that he is challenged and despised by those who are lining the streets. And so he had to climb a tree to see. So dude shimmies up this tree trunk, and as Jesus approaches, he makes eye contact with Zacchaeus. And Jesus shouts out, hey, Zacchaeus, uh, come down from there. I must stay at your house today. And the crowd responds, wait, what, Jesus? (laughs) Right? Jesus, you're going to be a guest at that sinner's house, that betrayer's house? 
that one who is all for himself and has sold us out? Jesus, you, do, do you not know what he's done? Let me tell you about Zacchaeus. You're not going to want to eat there. You're not going to want to go stay there. Don't you know who Zacchaeus is? I would never find myself in the presence of Zacchaeus on purpose, let alone be a guest in his house. Zacchaeus isn't a good guy, Jesus. You don't want to be guilty by association. You don't want to be unclean, Jesus. Do, do you know? I mean, you should know, Jesus, you remain virtuous by condemning and withdrawing, just like we do. So when you see Zacchaeus, you should condemn and withdraw, not go to his house. But that's not what Jesus does. And what happens is this outlandish way that Jesus does things and ends up producing fruit. It produces life. <clears throat> and in the days after said dinner, Zacchaeus ends up returning everything he's ever stolen. He sells his possession and he, possessions and he gives to those in need. And Jesus says salvation has come to this man named Zacchaeus. It changed him. Jesus' presence changed Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus found life, the fullness of life and salvation was ushered in. See, Jesus' seemingly impossible hospitality, I mean, who would want to eat with a tax collector? Jesus' impossible hospitality produced life in Zacchaeus. <clears throat> now, that's a great story and it's a great parallel to what we're talking about today, but I, I, sometimes I struggle when we cherry pick scriptures and narratives out of the Bible and we're like, see, this is what's happening. So let's go a little further. Um, uh, this isn't the only time something like this happens. In Mark 2, Levi, who's a tax collector, you better know him as Matthew. He had a dinner party for Jesus. But this wasn't a one-on-one -on -one dinner party. Uh, the text tells us that there were many tax collectors and sinners in attendance. This was a soiree. And the religious leaders gather outside the house, scoffing, and they grab one of Jesus' disciples, and they say, uh, hey, does Jesus know what he's doing? Why is Jesus eating with sinners? Why isn't he condemning and withdrawing? Is he not worried about being unclean? Remember, clean, unclean, that was, a, that was the religious class system at work. Who's good, who's bad, who's superior, who's less than. And all class systems allow people to do one thing particularly well, and that's avoid looking at oneself. Right? They, do, they, they, they avoid looking at oneself in exchange for looking at everyone else. Why be great if I can just punch down and be perceived as great? That's what they're saying here. Why would Jesus eat with them? when you can condemn them and remain clean. Hmm. Class systems were made for condemning and withdrawing, and we still see some of that today, fair? These religious leaders, they ask one of the disciples, is this Jesus not worried about being great? To whom is he going to belong if he's eating with sinners all the time? Is he going to condemn and withdraw and join us? Or is he, I mean, is he a good religious man or not? And upon hearing this, I love this, too, because the religious leaders are talking to one of Jesus' disciples, and Jesus responds. He's like, you're not going to talk about me? I can answer myself. Upon hearing this, Jesus replies, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come to save the sinner. Mm. Jesus offers impossible hospitality that life might be produced in others. Hmm. Two examples. Let's roll the dice on another one, huh? Let's try again. Check out the woman caught in adultery, John 8. Religious leaders are trying to trap Jesus at this point. They know that he's doing things in a way that they don't like, so, so let's try to trip him up in the law. Let's try, let's try to trip him up a little bit. Let's get him to say or do something that's actually against the things that he's preaching. We'll trip him up, and then we can condemn him. Okay? trying to get Jesus to slip up in his theology. See, these religious leaders, the religious system back then, we've talked about this before, they have a pretty good orthodoxy. They understand the faith pretty well. They understand their God about as well as a finite mind can understand, but they have a really shady orthopraxy, which means they don't practice it all that well. So they bring this woman before Jesus. 
which that's a whole nother note that a woman can be caught in adultery, but there's no man or no a partner caught in adultery. That's a whole nother sermon, and, I, and I, it's great stuff that we're going to pause today, but everything inside of me right now is like, share all this good information with them, but I'm not going to, so I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll get there someday. But they drag this woman before Jesus, and they say, hey, uh, Jesus, we're going to kill this woman. We're going to stone her, and uh, it's because she was caught in adultery, and it, by law, uh, we're allowed to do that. So what are you going to say, Jesus? We're not wrong for doing this. It's the law. She's guilty. What do you think? Are you going to throw stones with us, Jesus? And Jesus pauses, and, he, and he's like, you know what? You're right. She's guilty. How about this? Jesus is like, I got an idea. Whoever isn't guilty, whoever isn't worthy of condemnation, you go ahead and throw the first stone, and then we'll all kind of go from there. And slowly, rocks drop from the hands of the religious leaders, and they walk away. And Jesus asks the woman, hey, uh, who's, who's here to condemn you? And she goes, well, no one. And he goes, yeah, I don't condemn you either. So, so go and leave this life of sin. Impossible hospitality produces life time after time after time after time. Do you want to do another narrative? No, I got more to say, so we'll go on to something else. But, but these narratives are all over Scripture. It's not a, ooh, that's a great insight on one verse. No, 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 this is all over the place. This is a reoccurring theme of Jesus' time on earth. When presented with the opportunity to condemn and withdraw, he does something totally different. When presented with the opportunity to condemn, Jesus extends grace. When presented with the opportunity to withdraw from someone, even for reasons that are valid, Jesus leans in for reconciliation. This is nearly the exact opposite of our human impulse. Instead of condemning, he extends grace. Instead of withdrawing, he moves forward to reconnect. This isn't condemn and withdraw. This is grace and reconciliation. And what does that produce? Life for them all. Zacchaeus is experiencing the fullness of life, putting others first and caring for his community, owning his selfishness and attempting to make it right. Matthew, Levi, right, is invited to follow Jesus, to be an original carrier of the gospel, living not for himself, but for the good news and the glory of God. The woman caught in adultery, she's given the gift of re-entering the world, given life to live despite her being caught as guilty. Jesus doesn't define her by those things. He leans in and life is produced through impossible hospitality. All right, so there's a little bit of word stuff in here. I can't go a sermon without doing some stuff because it's just so rich. <laughs> so let me just put it this way. The word we most often translate as hospitality in the Greek is philoxenia. It means loving friend of the stranger. So sometimes we're like, oh, I'm going to be really hospitable and I'm going to have cheese and crackers out when, when I'm going to cut up these mango before my friends come over. Now that's hospitable like in, in, in our term, but hospi hospitality, um, when, when we're talking to scripture, is, loving, is being a loving friend of the stranger. So unless you're inviting strangers over to your house, it's not biblical hospitality, but we're not going to fight over that right now. Philoxenia is where we get our word philosophy, the love and search for wisdom. It's where we get the word xenophobia, right? Fear of those who are different than ourselves. Philoxenia, loving friend of the stranger. And this philoxenia, this hospitality, it's hard for us. It doesn't come naturally because when presented with a choice, most people will choose to condemn and withdraw when there's differences. When presented with a choice, most people will choose to be with those who have the same interests, the same experiences, the same upbringing, the same abilities, the same social circles, or even the same heritage, who have the same opinion. They surround themselves with people who are like them in some way, shape, or form. We aren't great at being around strangers, let alone loving them. And as a result, we actually end up missing out 
our life. The thing is, it's in, our, it's in our very nature. It's in our fallen nature to condemn and withdraw when someone isn't like us, when someone doesn't agree with us, when someone is more guilty than we are. And in our condemnation, in our withdrawing, we separate ourselves from others. And sometimes even, sometimes we even do so in the name of righteousness. We, sign, we find ourselves more focused on our position, on our status, on our judgment of others, and we avoid looking at ourselves. Hey, um, fine, yeah, we can, we can stone this woman, but um, how, about, how about whoever's not guilty? You throw the first one. See, when we condemn and withdraw, we're just like 14-year-old Nate, finger-pointed for my own personal benefit. Jesus' impossible hospitality, his outlandish loving of the stranger, time and time again produces life. Don't forget that it's Jesus' loving you when you were a stranger, when you were an enemy of God, that produced life in and through and for you. So if we desire to live life fully, which I hope you all desire to live life fully, We've got to stop looking at others to determine our value or our status. We've got to stop condemning and withdrawing just so we look a little better. We have to stop condemning and withdrawing so we're just a little less guilty. We have to stop condemning and withdrawing so that we feel a little better about ourselves. Because when push comes to shove, we all need God's mercy and we all benefit from God's grace. Amen? For by grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. See, we have been mercifully offered a pardon in and by Jesus Christ. The pardon that allows us, it gives us, it gives us the ability to be who God intended us to be. That pardon allows us us to pursue righteousness even though we are unrighteous the pardon allows us to be transformed into a new creation by the presence and power of our god if we are willing i joked i i said earlier i wasn't a joke but i said the second greatest story ever told is our own personal testimony well there's nothing stronger than god's will fair you know what the second strongest thing in all creation is Human will. Human will. We are offered the opportunity to live life fully if you are willing. And it's by grace that all this happens, that we're reminded to look at ourselves. Remember what, what Paul said? It's by grace I share these words, and then he tells us to look at ourselves to judge ourselves, not that we might beat ourselves up over how terrible we are. I don't think back to when I was 14 years old and go, oh, woe is me. I'm not, I'm not fit for the kingdom of, of our God. I don't beat myself up like, oh, God can never love me. I took a Camry. Right? Could you imagine on the day of judgment and the Lord's like, you know what? A Camry debacle. <laughs> right? You said it was number 10, but I got to tell you, Nate, your buddy tried to buy cigarettes, and who knows what you would have done, yeah. right? Hmm. No, we don't. We're not to, to look at ourselves to beat ourselves up. No, we're to look at ourselves that we might notice where God is working on us. That we might see God's grace on display in ourselves and on our own journey. That we might take our eyes off others, and we might find life where we are. Instead of pushing others down so we feel better about ourselves, life is a product of gracious reconciliation. Life is a product of connection. Sometimes I get sick of saying it, but I forget it so often. Our God is in community and connection with God's self. We don't understand this Trinity thing, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three persons, one divine entity, but God is never alone. And we are made in the image of God, so being alone doesn't really work for us. We are connected here. We're connected in families. We're connected in families that we create. We're connected with friends. 
Maybe we're connected with, with a significant other. We're connected with, with animals. We're connected with creation. You ever walk outside barefoot? It feel, feels different, right? I mean, unless you're on gravel, but it feels different. You're connected to creation. We are made for connection and community, and life is a product of said connection, specifically when we're connected to our creator, to our savior, to the divine. You all know John 3.16? Yes? Do you know John 3.17? Don't forget this one. We know John 3.16. I mean, for God to love the, that he gave his only, whomsoever shall not, but ever. Okay, good. <laughs> we know that one. That's even on signs at NFL games. I don't know if you do that down here in Miami, but we do that a lot in Detroit because our Lions, oh, sweet baby Jesus, come on. Give me, give me something. <laughs> yeah, but you're better. Much, we'll take, we'll take a Miami Dolphins record. We haven't won in ever. Don't forget John 3, 17. For God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to save it. Why do we live so often like Jesus came to condemn? God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son, whomsoever believes in him shall not perish, have everlasting life. For God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to save it. Apparently, condemning and withdrawing doesn't change a human heart. You don't know what's good for you. I'm, this is tough love. I'm doing this because Jesus loves you. I'm never going to talk to you again because of what you've done. <laughs> you are not welcome here. Why? Because that is not what God wants, and God will work on you. This is tough love. Turn your back. John 3, 17. That doesn't quite work. A heart has never been won to righteousness by condemning and withdrawing. <clears throat> but unmerited grace, as if there's any other kind. And reconciliation has, does, and will continue to change the world until the day our Savior comes back. Sure, I could close this sermon this morning by challenging you all to practice impossible hospitality. In fact, some of you who are thinking ahead, you're like, ooh, he said that enough times, that's where we're going. We're gonna be challenged to impossible hospitality. And you know what? You should do it. But at that same time, um, <clears throat> I want to I end this sermon with a different focus. Yes, Jesus offered an impossible hospitality, and that is where life is found. And I could challenge you to love where no love is returned. I could challenge you to forgive even those most egregious actions. I could challenge you to love the strangers who the world and even the institutional church doesn't always want to love. And all of those are good things. But I don't think that'd be faithful to the passage that the Holy Spirit has brought to us this morning. Not that we shouldn't do those things, but there's something else. Hmm. No, today I think that we're being reminded by, by the power and presence of our God that we need to experience life before we can ever offer it. Today, I think that we need to be reminded that we have to start with ourselves. So often, our faith and our faith history has been so focused on we need to go share love, and we have to. I've even said it. I've preached it. And I'll continue to. But I'll tell you what, you can't go share love in life unless you're experiencing love in life. You can't. And just because you're showing up online or in person with a smile on your face and you're singing the songs and you brought in donations and you're feeling good, that doesn't mean you're experiencing a full life, the fullness of life that is offered to us. It's hard to give when, you're, when your tank isn't full, isn't it? When you get burned out, and then maybe others will condemn and withdraw from you because you're not producing the way you used to, or you feel like you have to condemn and withdraw to feel good about the fact that you can't really produce what they want, so you're like, that church asks too much of me. And maybe it's all because we're not experiencing the fullness of life. We're not full. Hmm. Today we're reminded we need to experience life before we can offer it. Today we're reminded that we need to start with ourselves. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. <clears throat> we would call that humility, wouldn't we? 
Today, we need to be reminded that life is found in humility. Zacchaeus found humility. So did Matthew. So did the woman. Because in these stories, I got to tell you, we aren't Jesus. I love the way Sean put it earlier. Once again, I'm not calling Pastor Sean because brother preached this morning. <laughs> okay. He said, how great would it be to look in that mirror and see Jesus? Absolutely. Amen. That doesn't mean you are Jesus. That means you need to receive that truth before you could do anything else. You need to receive the fact that this is the life that's been offered to you. Hmm. Yes, you are a child of God. Yes, you are redeemed and forgiven. But has that sunk in? In these stories, we aren't Jesus. Sadly enough, we are either the accusers or we are the guilty. And both need to find humility if they ever want to share the life that we find in Christ. Remember, the religious leaders thought that they were sharing life, but they weren't. Because they wouldn't look at themselves. Zacchaeus didn't think he was sharing life. He thought he was good. Don't worry about sharing just yet. Your time will come on those things. Our time might be better spent on learning how to receive. And for that, we must be humble. I struggle receiving grace. I struggle receiving gifts. I struggle receiving assistance. I even struggle receiving compliments. In fact, if you've ever offered me a compliment, I might respond as if I've received it, but I don't believe a word you say. And that's, I'm being totally honest with you. But that's not a you problem, that's a me problem. And so when I share that with some people, they're like, well, I'll just, I'll, I just won't compliment you anymore. Well, that just makes it worse. <laughs> Even though I'm not going to believe it, I'm working on receiving. But we have to be careful. When we practice humility, we've got to be careful because there's a very thin line between humility and humiliation. Humility is, is thinking... Hmm. Humility is lowering your view of self. I'm not that great. And lowering it. Whereas humiliation is having a low view of self. Thin line. One is healthy. One is destructive. Humility considers oneself, receives Jesus' impossible hospitality, and finds life. Humiliation condemns oneself and withdraws from God's grace, misses out on life, life that's been offered to it graciously because we become victims of our own condemnation. Have you ever become a victim of your own condemnation? Where the world hasn't told you how terrible you are, but you assume what the world would say, and then you're actually harder on yourself, and next thing you know, you're just a puddle of mush on the floor because you think that you are worthless, and really you just victimized yourself and you've humiliated yourself because you've lowered your thoughts about yourself so much that you are worthless. You ever experienced something like that? Me too. Humility and humiliation have a fine line. One is healthy, one is not. God is looking for people. This is a quote by A.W. Tozer. I love this quote. God is, <coughs> excuse me, God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do by ourselves. You know why I believe, I, I believe that we plan only the things we can accomplish on our own because we don't know how to receive life, so we don't got the fuel in the tank to do the impossible that God wants us to do. I believe the impossible is ready to be done in this community, in your communities, in your neighborhoods, in your life. And I think that Spirit Song is a part of that. And I think other churches in this area are too. I think the kingdom is ready to fall on us. Holy Spirit is going to change this place for love personified in the body of Christ. With that being said, I think that we're stuck. Either not knowing how to receive life, or we still humiliate ourselves to the point where we don't quite know how to distribute that love. Do you want to do the impossible? Do you want God to work, uh, to do his work through his impossible grace, his loving forgiveness, his miraculous regeneration through you? Yes and amen. We all do. Well, that all starts with being willing to let God work his impossible grace, his loving forgiveness, his miraculous regeneration in you. When you're getting ready to go out, you're going to go out, you're going to have a nice dinner, maybe. You're going to go out and, I don't know, you're going to have some kind of activity. You're going to go dancing. Does anyone go dancing anymore? You're going to leave the house. It's post-COVID. Leaving the house is enough. You're getting ready to go out. What's the last thing you do before you leave? You check that mirror. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> you see how I had to do this? Because no mirrors are ever tall enough. Sean gets it. You got to do this. <laughs> you check the mirror one last time just to make sure you are all set before you can enter the world. We got to make sure we're good. The same is true here. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. We've got to check ourselves. And when we do so, we've got to do so with humility. Can we receive? Can we experience the life that God has offered to us in Jesus Christ? Because it's there. <laughs> it's there. Jesus' impossible hospitality is being offered to you every day. And through it, he graciously gives us life and life abundantly. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, isn't it? Isn't it interesting how we get in our own way so often? We want to love with such fervor, with such excitement. But we really stink at receiving it, Lord. And so may we look in the mirror this morning. May we learn that practice, not that we condemn ourselves, but that we can, <laughs> we can see ourselves clearly. That we can see ourselves clearly enough in the mirror that you show us the transformation that's taking place inside of us. That when we receive life and love and forgiveness and fullness, when we gaze back up at that mirror, we do see your face, Jesus. We want to be just like you. But the first step is we need to receive what you've offered us. Lord, thank you for your goodness even though we don't always do a great job of receiving it. We pray this in your name. Amen. We'll stand together.